know the rules, but I, I, I don't have much time to, to follow much of the professional sports, I have to oh, say. You, you have to have one favorite sport. Though. Well, I'm from St. Louis, so if I support Ooh. any team, it's the St. Louis Cardinals, which is a fantastic baseball team. Uh, and ice hockey, St. Louis Blues. Uh, but I do live in, you know, outside Washington now. But um, I think the reason why I used to follow sports very closely, but, you know, I, I left, I joined the Army back in 2002, and I was overseas the whole time. And this was before everything was streamed. Wow. So I didn't have access to watch like all this stuff, you know. So after a decade overseas, you know, I just kind of like lost interest. But are you a are you a baseball fan? Yes. All right, I mean, good. Very it's good. Strange meeting a Turkish baseball fan, but no, that's great. When you come to Washington, if you do, let me know. We'll go to a Nats game. I love going oh, to a game. You know, I would I would rather go to the Camden Yards to be honest. Okay. I, <laughs> well, I want to see Camden Yards, you know the Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, well if we ever find ourselves uh, there at the same time, we All can right. go there. <laughs> All right. I mean, Maryland is close enough. Yeah. To these, you know? <laughs> yeah. Depending on traffic. Obviously. <laughs> so we will begin in a couple of minutes, I guess. Okay, we will. We are waiting for the president of the university. He will be online in a minute or so. And as soon as he's online, we will begin. Do you have any questions you want to ask before we begin? I mean, I was planning something else, but now we will have sort of like, I don't know, I will ask a few questions, then maybe we will have I mean, I will speak a little bit very shortly, then the president of the university will speak maybe three, three, four minutes. Then I'll basically just go around. You can chat amongst each other as well, because I mean, the, the two people are missing. So I will begin first the president, then the minister, then basically I will go to you guys. If anyone wants to speak first, that's fine. So uh, I, tell me. So I was told we had to kind of present a 10 minute presentation. Is that still the case? Yes. Ah, okay. I mean, yes, but or less. it doesn't have like a PowerPoint presentation. Oh, no. It's just, you know, like, like what do you think about the general situation now? Basically, it's very, uh, so it's up to you to discuss whatever, you know, if you want to discuss the Taliban, fine. If you want to discuss the removed government, fine, whatever. So you have let, left at the discretion of the panelists. So you have given them very open choice. <laughs> yes. Because we have two missing. So, you know. Oh, they had to pull out in the last minute. Sorry, Professor Karaji is calling. Hello, Jam. Başkan yok da. Tamam, 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 Jam. Kutuca başlayın diyor. Başkanı beklemeyin. Nasıl başlatacağız? Şu an başlayabiliriz. Tamam. Normal başlayabilirsiniz. Hello today. Hello everyone. Uh, today we will talk about uh, a subject that's been discussed very much in the international circles. And this is the seventh of our international webinar series. I welcome all our guests who are on the panel and all the listeners that are listening right now. I have very esteemed guests with me right now uh, from left to right. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Luke Coffey from the Foreign Policy Center at the Heritage Foundation. He is with us live on live feed from Washington, D.C., capital of the United States. We have Tanya Gosuzian, sorry for the horrible pronunciation, but I am sure you are used to it by now. Uh, she is the head of interviews for the TRT World, a big name on international media. We also have Dr. Saif Urrahman Malik from uh, Institute of Strategic Studies in Islamabad. He is the director of Indian Study Center. He's from Pakistan. And welcome, uh, doctor, as well. And normally, these webinars were carried out by Professor Karaja, Kutai Karaja. However, he is uh, unfortunately sick. He got the Chinese, Chinese virus. And uh, we all wish him well as well. I hope he recovers in time. Uh, as most of you know him very well, we are all sure that 
He will pull through in a matter of days. Well, obviously, the issue of Afghanistan has been a matter of debate for a very long time. And some recent developments have been discussed in the past few weeks as major changes happened as the US troops uh, left along with many other foreign uh, powers, as Taliban took over most of the country and is now sort of fighting or bargaining to gain control of it all. So today we will discuss this issue. But before we begin, I would like to remind people that we originally had two uh, people from Afghanistan talking about this subject. However, uh, we could not sort of uh, welcome them as they pulled just half an hour before the sort of webinar was to begin. Hence, if you are asking why there are no Afghanis talking about Afghanistan, that's why we had two, but I know there are some pressures and difficulties in Afghanistan right now. So I sympathize with their position. But however, if they let us know beforehand, not half an hour ago, but a few hours maybe earlier, it would have been better for us as well. So Mr. Kofi, I would like to begin with you as I think you have some field experience as well, which is invaluable. Uh, so basically, it has been 20 years. 9-11 was one of the most horrible things in American history. And after that, the world sort of entered into a new era. And we saw the invasion of Afghanistan. But now, 20 years later, uh, we see a new sort of uh, picture. So if you were to evaluate this 20-year process shortly, obviously, and then see now what it has led to would be a, a nice point to, I think, open up the debate today. Thank you, and um, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're watching. Uh, first, I want to thank Istanbul Aydin University for organizing this panel and for inviting me to speak here today. Um, to answer your question, uh, how did it all go over the past 20 years? I would say it all ended in complete failure. Um, it didn't have to be this way, but this is the way it has ended up. Um, I've been involved uh, with Afghanistan in some capacity, one way or the other, for most of these 20 years. I served there when I was in the U.S. Army, um, when I was working in the United Kingdom in the House of Commons and their Ministry of Defense. I was advising on Afghan issues, and I was routinely visiting the country during this time. And here at the Heritage Foundation, I work with a team of scholars that focuses on uh, Central Asia, South Asia, and of course, Afghanistan is like right in the middle there. Um, and so that's what saddens me the most by what we have seen in the past uh, several weeks is that all of this was uh, avoidable. And now we have this terrible um, uh, geopolitical irony that the Taliban on September 11th, 2021 actually controlled more ter actually controls more territory and land in Afghanistan than it did on September 11th, 2001. And I think um, there are a couple of reasons why America was eventually brought to this failure. Um, I, I do believe it, it started with uh, President Trump's rhetoric about ending the forever wars. Um, you know, m this resonated well with Americans. By the time Trump entered office, we had been in Afghanistan for 15 years. Uh, when you talk about ending a war that's lasted for 15 years, most Americans think, yeah, that's a good idea. President Biden continued with this messaging about ending the forever wars. Uh, but there was a problem with this message. Um, firstly, until President Trump started talking about forever wars, no one in America even thought about Afghanistan. Uh, your average American didn't think twice about the U.S. military presence in Afghanistan. It was relatively small. When Trump entered office, it was about 18,000 troops, down from about a peak of 100,000 in 2010. 
the U.S. was taking very few uh, combat fatalities compared to what they were taking. It was never in the headlines, never in the news. Many people didn't talk about it, but President Trump knew that with his base, this this line, this uh, about ending this forever war, um, resonated and worked well. President Biden saw how well this line worked, and he continued with this line. Uh, but I would say for different reasons. Um, President Biden, uh, we know, looking throughout history uh, of well, his history, has never been a supporter of a big U.S. military presence in Afghanistan. If you go back to 2009, when um, President Obama was undergoing his Afghan st- strategic review, uh, President Biden, w- Vice President Biden, then was the person advocating for the smaller force, smaller counterterrorism force, smaller training force, reduce the U.S. presence in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, Secretary Clinton, Secretary of Defense Robert Gates, and others around Obama were advocating for the surge. It, like in Iraq, you know, send tens of thousands of more troops in, spend tens of billions of dollars more. Hopefully we'll get a better result. In the end, Biden lost that debate in the White House when he was vice president. So the irony here is that when Biden entered office on in January of this year, he inherited the Biden proposal. He had two and a half thousand troops that were on the ground conducting counterterrorism operations and uh, or two, two and a half thousand troops conducting a training and advising mission with a smaller counterterrorism operation alongside um, close air support to the Afghan military, which was essential for them. Uh, and this cost the U.S. taxpayer about $18 billion a year, which in 2011, we spent that about every 40 days in Afghanistan. In 2011, the American taxpayer was spending $300 million a day in Afghanistan leading combat operations. Uh, So Biden inherited his own plan, but he still wanted out of Afghanistan. And now we see where we are today. You know, a lot of uh, finger pointing is taking place here in Washington. The Democrats are blaming Trump. Uh, Trump uh, Republicans are are blaming Biden. There is plenty of blame to go around going back the full 20 years. There's no doubt about that. But uh, the the difference between President Biden and President Trump is that when President Trump entered office and wanted to get out of Afghanistan, he first conducted an interagency review. And this review assessed what the U.S. goals were in the region and how the U.S. can meet these goals. And then President Trump presented a strategy. You might have liked this strategy. You might have hated this strategy, but it was a strategy. Whereas President Biden entered office and there was no review, no interagency assessment, nothing. He said, we're getting out. And now we have the uh, terrible situation that we see today. So that's my quick overview of of how we got to where we are. Now, I, I think it could have all been different had President Biden maintained the smaller U.S. force, stop the in the forever wars rhetoric. So get Afghanistan out of the headlines, um, continued with the close air support and the civilian contractors to support the Afghan military. uh, We wouldn't be where we are today. And uh, there are a half dozen places around the world where the U.S. has about two and a half thousand troops providing a counterterrorism and training and advising mission in North Africa, the Horn of Africa, in the Middle East, and the Philippines. Americans don't care. Americans don't talk about this. But it was Afghanistan that was brought up to the political forefront by Trump and by, uh, by President Biden. And my final point here um, on the assessment of the last 20 years, President Biden said that he inherited this plan from President Trump and he could not change it. Now, we don't know what a second Trump term would have done with that May 1st deadline that Trump negotiated with the Taliban. Perhaps President Trump would have done the same thing, and we would have lived all of this again, but with the Trump administration. Perhaps he would have changed his mind or modified it a bit like he did with Syria. Um, But we'll never know. But what we do know is that President Biden has been in the Oval Office for more than 200 days, and now the Taliban is back in power. You know, and of the dozens of other policy 
uh, policies and the dozen, dozens of other decisions taken by the Trump administration that the Biden administration was willing to change overnight um, when he entered the White House, he now tells us that this was the one Trump era policy that he could not change. I don't buy it. I don't believe it. if he wanted to change it, he could have. He decided not to. Now we're living with the consequences. Actually, we're not living with I'm not living with the consequences yet. Uh, the yeah. Afghan people are living with the consequences. Also, the region is affected. They're in the region right now. Immediately, the Afghans are living with it. Soon will be the region. And I fear soon will be even people further afield that will have to live with these consequences. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we will return to the effects of this. So I would also like to, in the coming minutes, I would also like to discuss the effects of this issue in the interior politics of US as well with you. Uh, now with us, we have the, we have Hikmet Çetin, former foreign minister of foreign affairs for Turkey and who served as the NATO secretary general, uh, uh, first senior civilian representative in Afghanistan. Uh, so welcome, Mr. Minister. Can you hear me? Yes, I do. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, welcome again. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to ask you, you have been there uh, for a long time and you were overseeing the operation as the first senior civilian. What has happened, uh, as you can say, as you are, uh, you have a great deal of experience on this subject, what has happened that led to this sort of uh, fiasco as described by Mr. Coffey, as the withdrawal of the troops? Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Of course, I was a bit late because it was a misunderstanding. Uh, uh, well, uh, I think this is the, I would say at the beginning, this is the failure of NATO and US in Afghanistan. We have to accept that this is a failure. Well, of course, so many things happened last 20 years, but at the end of the day, US and NATO came because uh, Afghanistan, uh, Taliban was in power, and now they left, and again, Taliban is in power. One of them, I think now I think no one can predict what was going to be the future of Afghanistan, uh, because uh, this is a very, very difficult situation. And uh, I think US, when they had a, a discussion in Doha for many, for many months, I think, without Afghanistan, Afghanistan was not there. And the only thing they did, of course, there was one of the articles that Afghanistan, that the Taliban would have a coalition government, coalition with, with the government, and they will have inclusive government in Afghanistan. And then after a couple of years, the new constitution go back to election. Without, uh, without seeing what this, of course, U.S. suddenly left. When U.S. left, uh, just, uh, just the one day, and they, they should know that Taliban was very strong and they will, they will capture all country. Because I think they, could, they, could, they should stay to see until the coalition between inclusive government, between Taliban and, government, and the Afghan government. That will be the better situation, of course. Now, as we know now that uh, the situation is very, very difficult. And uh, the problem is not only Taliban now, because including ISIS and Al-Qaeda and so many other radical, radical Wahhabi or, or ideology uh, terrorist group will, will come to Afghanistan. And my my I hope I will be wrong, but my 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 fear is that the, the, the Afghanistan one day will may become the, the the country of terrorism, terrorist country. Taliban itself doesn't have any problem with other country. Never had any uh, terrorist attack in out out of Afghanistan or Pakistan. 
but ISIS and, and, and Al-Qaeda is not there. And I think the region will be under threat. And not only the region, I think maybe the whole world will be under uh, real threat. Because uh, all the terrorists, Islamic terror organizations are look, looking for country to go and to, to, to stay there. Uh, they left, uh, most, most mainly they, they left Syria, Iraq, and now Afghanistan is there. And we, we, we could see two weeks ago when uh, Afghanistan, when, when uh, Taliban entered to Kabul, uh, ISIS immediately had a terrorist attack and 175 people, person, just died uh, that day. Well, the uh, one problem, of course, uh, the, the, the woman will pay the price. When I was there, I had many, too many times talk with the women. They were, they, they were saying that they are looking for peace. They want to see the peace, but they don't want to pay the price. Now we can see that the woman is going to pay the price. And because uh, Taliban sometimes they've given the quite normal statement that they will not be, uh, they went when they had it before, they will allow women and girls and so on, but they will never do that. Because uh, as, we need, as we see now, the women are out of, out of job, school is not, the girls are not going to school and uh, the women will, 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 will pay the price. And the second, of course, my, my assessment, uh, if going to have like this one, this, this policy in the future, Afghanistan may face with uh, civil war. This is, of course, my ses second assessment. It may have to, it may go to civil war. That will be very difficult for the whole, whole country in the world, mainly neighboring countries, Central Asian countries and, and Iran, Pakistan, and so on. Because uh, uh, they, they, they only say that they are going to follow the, the, the Sharia law. They never change that policy because they always see the Sharia law. And we know what's, what, what, what Sharia law is look about because there is no, no right for the woman. Women will not be able to go to school again. And should, the girls will not be able to go to school. They will not be able to go back to job. And uh, uh, still, there is only one way that now we, we can help them to, to, to push Afghan Taliban government to have inclusive government. Because Taliban at the end of the day is the is Pashtun movement. And it is Pashtun nationalistic. This, this is their Pasht, mainly Pashtun. And Pashtun is uh, about 40% of the population. And we have Hazara, we have Tajik, we have Turkmen, we have, uh, we have Uzbek. And, and others. And the only way that international community can help now to push Afghanistan Taliban government to have uh, uh, inclusive government, that will be the uh, way out to, 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 of difficulties. So far, well, they are saying this is the, the transition government, but I, I don't think so. It will go, going to be the uh, real that will go to stay there, and they 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 are not changing. The most radical people uh, person in the Taliban now they have two important jobs. One is the Minister of Interior, Hakani, which is a terrible person, and and I think the whole NATO and US try to deal with that man or that group twenty years and we're not able to, to do anything about him because he used to go to Pakistan and so on. And the second important thing is the Minister of Defense. It is the son of Mullah Umar. Mullah Umar is the number one person or founder of uh, Taliban. And with this government, of course, 
I don't think so. That I don't think that will be have a, a inclusive government. But uh, we have to to, to to help try to help them. And uh, because uh, well, uh, uh, because uh, without the inclusive government, uh, there will be every country, the respective regional country, will be in difficulties. And uh, I hope the world will not wait until to have another 9/11, because uh, in 19 in 1990s end of 1990s until 2011, uh, 2001. Uh, I was foreign minister at that time. I was telling them that, please be careful. The Taliban is coming. But no one listened until 9-11. And uh, I hope the world will not wait until another 9-11 or something else, something like that. We have to, to deal with Afghanistan and try to help them, the Afghan people, and uh, as much as we can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I will have a follow-up question as well as we after we complete the first tour. Uh, Ms. Gutsuzian, sorry again for my pronunciation. Uh, how the events were covered on uh, media and how do you, as a seasoned reporter, how do you see uh, the covering of these events and how, as the events unfolded, how sort of, how do you see the media coverage was? Do you find it successful? Do you find it sufficient or how do you see it? This is my sort of- Now or in the, or in the past? No, to, this is my question is to Ms. Gutsuzian, Mr. Minister. Uh, Alihan, thank you for um, having sure. me today uh, among such an impressive uh, group. Um, I've been traveling to and writing about Afghanistan since 2001 uh, for, for various publications. Uh, I've interviewed politicians across the spectrum, from the late Zahir Shah to the assassinated President Rabani, President Ghani, and recently the former Prime Minister Gulbuddin Hekmatyar. Uh, Luke and uh, Ambassador Chetin discussed in fascinating uh, detail the failures of the US and NATO leading to the fiasco we have today. Uh, but I'll focus, uh, as you said, on what has been another increasingly debated component uh, of the Taliban's return to power their public relations campaign before and after the uh, takeover. Um, in 2019, I argued in a piece uh, published in the Washington Post that the Taliban had not changed. They had simply gotten better at PR. They showed the world a new improved Taliban with a more modern face. Now they seem to be reverting back to hype, uh, back to type and changing their PR into a tool for internal control. Uh, as the Taliban took part in the Doha talks, they seemed starkly different from the fanatical primitives who drew the world's attention in the wake of the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks. Back then, the headlines focused on public executions in sports stadiums, bans on music television, and the deliberate destruction of archeological uh, treasures. Women accused of adultery were stoned to death and girls were imprisoned behind family walls. But as the Doha talks progressed, Western media began to present stories about young Taliban fighters playing cricket, hugging government uh, security forces during religious festivals, and raising normal families. Even Afghans themselves expressed surprise at the sophistication of the insurgent negotiators. Over the years, through various social media platforms, the Taliban were indeed able to depict themselves as patriots, legitimate negotiators, leaders committed to human rights and ready to govern with a broad-based inclusive government. They decried the corruption of the elected government of Ashrafani and painted the military as traitors and tools of the occupiers. And this gave rise to the notion of a Taliban 2.0, a kinder, gentler organization. It was a comforting thought for those who fully supported the talks in Doha and for those that saw a return of the Taliban into the government as an inevitability. Fast forward to August 2021, when after a bloodless takeover of Kabul, the Taliban are now in control of the country. 
Scarcely a month later, they appear to be reneging on nearly every commitment to both the Afghan people and the international community. Despite repeated assurances by spokesmen such as Zabiullah Mujahid and the Doha-based Suhail Shaheen, the newly formed Taliban administration is anything but broad-based and inclusive, nor has it shown any interest in maintaining even the most basic civil liberties. Now, while some may suggest the recent images of protest crackdowns, beheadings of soldiers and stone-faced hardliners appointing, appointed to government positions are misunderstandings, excesses committed during a rapid takeover or mistakes soon to be rectified, the carefully crafted image of Taliban 2.0 is increasingly showing cracks. So what happened? Does this mark the end of the Taliban public relations campaign? Probably not. I argue that their PR objectives have merely transformed. Pre-takeover, public relations was used to craft an image of modernity and pragmatism. Post-takeover, public relations is used to impose control and power. The Taliban communication objectives pre-takeover were to persuade internal and external audiences that the organization was reformed, liberal, patriotic, and inclusive. In my mind, there were four main objectives. First, to erode the people's faith in the government to rule honestly and provide security. Second, to, er um, to erode the morale of the Afghan forces by pushing a narrative that presented the Taliban as militarily undefeatable. Third, to declare that a Taliban takeover was inevitable in the wake of the Doha agreement. And last, to rebrand themselves as a more moderate and reformed movement which would govern transparently and inclusively as well as respect human rights. This was catnip to both the Afghan people and an international community desperate to withdraw and terrifying to the Afghan security forces. The collapse of the Afghan military, quickly followed by a bloodless takeover of the government, were in no small part due to this effective strategy. Yet the post-takeover Taliban communications objectives are now meant to intimidate, repress, and control. I see it having five major objectives. First, to enforce control. Second, to demonstrate the power to quash any armed resistance from military or opposition movements. Third, to enact new social norms throughout Afghan society. Fourth, to limit speech and demonstrations except that which amplifies the new status quo. And fifth, to coerce the international community to accept the new realities. So far, the Taliban seem to be succeeding. Now, it would be perilous for the international community to delude itself into believing that the Taliban are malleable to influence or susceptible to persuasion. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken reflected the views of many nations. Um, he may believe that the Taliban seek external legitimacy and support, but there are no signs to date that the Taliban are modifying their behavior to earn that legitimacy. While many, may, uh, while many, many might believe that the September 2021 images of killings and beatings along with repressive policies, um, which take away the hard earned rights of the past 20 years, are merely mistakes or excesses, excesses of the transition period, one can take little solace from the historical records of, Taliban, uh, of totalitarian victories. In summary, this new public relations campaign is hardly a novel approach. It has been the playbook for totalitarian regimes throughout history. Whether the 1917 Russian Revolution, the 1949 Chinese Revolution, the 1996 takeover of Afghanistan by the Taliban, or scores of other coups and revolutions, public relations has been a key weapon in the arsenal of the supposed liberators. Before what is promised is liberation. After what is delivered is subjugation. We've seen this many times before and the PR campaign of the Taliban shows that we are seeing this play out once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will have a follow up question for you as well. But uh, first of all, I would like to continue with uh, Dr. Malik, can you hear me, doctor? Yes, please. Uh, we all know that uh, Pakistan is having very good relations with China right now. Uh, if you ask me, it's too good, too cozy for my taste. But now we have a we see a triangle of sorts in the region between Pakistan, 
the Taliban government in Afghanistan and China. So how do you see the relationship between these three parties will develop? Thank you, thank you. First of all, let me extend my heartiest gratitude to Istanbul Island University and for arranging a very important uh, webinar, which is the topic of the day around the globe. So uh, no exception to our Dutch friends and brothers as well. And thank you for inviting me. Uh, this, prior to responding your question, which you have, you have posed to me, I will be making my deliberation on a couple of points, starting with the evolving situation in Afghanistan, challenges faced by the Taliban government, and in case of their failure, its implications, and uh, Pakistani perspective on the ongoing situation. And lastly, to your question, which you have asked. Well, uh, once we look at the current scenario in Afghanistan, it really made surprise to everyone around the globe who was having an, a special focus on Afghanistan. No one, one was expecting that uh, uh, this speedy takeover by Taliban, that too in a short time, that too. Then again, it left so many questions and the conspiracy theories as well. Why three lakh soldiers could not resist despite the excellent training and the weapon and the equipment. I will not go into that discussion. First, they took cover. The things were in a state of chaos, no clarity, but slowly and gradually things started picking up. So, ladies and gentlemen, whenever there is some transition take place, transition is always a complex, complicated, and a painful process, uh, whatever the transition is. And uh, no exception in the case of Taliban as well. It was expected that they will go for the inclusive government. Initially, things were not uh, clear. Even the Taliban, they were having some, uh, they themselves were lacking clarity what to do with the things because of the fast paced development. So initially they had uh, their uh, interim setup and there was no representation to the other ethnic groups. Uh, but uh, today, uh, this uh, afternoon, I have learned that uh, they have added two projects as well as the ethnic uh, uh, member in their, uh, uh, this uh, shura or whatever they call it, their interim setup. And the more important is the uh, declaring a Tajik um, as a chief of, uh, as a supreme commander of the, their forces, again, uh, who led their uh, Taliban when they attacked the Panjshir and uh, with little resistance they took over. So these were something which really surprised the people. And uh, uh, coming to uh, this ongoing situation, we see that uh, Taliban initially, the, 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 the world was seeing that probably they are not coming up to their aspiration, but uh, uh, we can see that uh, there are so many media personnel are there in Kabul and making live reports. Uh, Tanya was also mentioning the state of affairs and mentioning rightly the objective. I, I, certainly I agree with her. Uh, I can see that gradually they are opening the schools. I can see that they are gradually going for the uh, opening of the even women education as well because uh, they have, we could see the visual that there were some uh, classes were going on where we can see the girls take, uh, going with the education. But I was really wondering uh, and very, uh, I, I beg pardon to uh, His Excellency Hikmat uh, Chaitan, uh, about that, if they go for Sharia, then, then there will be no education for women. I think this is contrary to the Sharia and the Islamic law. Uh,
which really insist that education for men and women is the <laughs> obligation <laughs> on every woman. <laughs> because it's the moral and the religious obligation, education of the women. So if they say Sharia, then they cannot deny education to a women as well. Since today they have added two ethnic Tajiks, and I hope and expected that since it is an interim setup, when they will go for a proper setup, they have to uh, um, take on board to the rest of the uh, ethnic groups, like uh, uh, Melissa was mentioning with Turkmen, Uzbeks, and the Tajiks, and the Hazaras as well. Coming to the most uh, uh, pressing challenges to, to the Taliban at the moment. First of all, establishing setup consolidation of the setup and getting it recognized from the world. So far, only it is the Uzbeks who have given some signal of positivity towards, uh, uh, towards uh, the Taliban, other than, than Pakistan, China, and Tajikistan, they are so far with the cautious optimism about the things and they are just watching the situation that how the things take along. Coming to the the most pressing challenge to the Taliban at the moment is the sustainability of economy. Because their assets are frozen at the moment. You will be surprised to know that in the in the Ashraf Ghani era, for the last era, <laughs> the government employees were not paid the same. This was very surprising. They have to run the government. For running the government, they need the finances. If finances are not provided by the international community, then I can foresee a big humanitarian crisis. In that case, then the vulnerability to the region, none of the regional countries is in a position to accept the refugees. Even within Afghanistan, there's a displacement of 3 million people as a result of the recent development. So, Taliban, rather Afghans, badly need the support of the international community. And at the moment, it is the UN only provided uh, the, some sort of support. Some little broken assistance from Pakistan, and uh, if I am not wrong, from, uh, uh, from Qatar, but mostly from Pakistan, then UN plane we can see in um, Kabul and, and various places. So uh, it is the foremost uh, uh, urge from the international community to, to safeguard the Afghan nation from the humanitarian disaster. They must be helped. At least they should be self-sufficient, sustained economy at least. Otherwise, I think in the absence of that, if the Taliban are weakened, then uh, I agree with the minister, then ISS, element, Al-Qaeda, and uh, another uh, uh, group which is quite uh, uh, volatile, that is Islamic State of Khurasan province, that will get strengthened and they will pose challenge, not to Afghanistan, but the neighboring state as well. I think that will be a bigger challenge. So. I think let's international community come forward and to help the Afghan nation for rebuilding. Unfortunately, $2, million, $2 trillion plus support to Afghanistan is not witness to anyone. So even they don't have the money to pay to, the, to run the affairs of the state. And so that is why I say that it is one of the important humanitarian challenge if they are not uh, uh, help uh, because they already had Taliban inherited a weak state of affairs. So on ground, they are financially, they are penniless at the moment. Coming to uh, Pakistan in perspective, I think this is very important. Other than Afghans, it is the Pakistan which paid the biggest cost of the Afghan crisis sacrificing their 70,000 civilian and the military forces, security forces, the biggest loss. And 
a damage to $140 billion plus damage to economy. Hosted 3 million at the moment registered refugees are in Pakistan and I am afraid 2 million or more who are here and there in various parts of the country. Peace in Pakistan is directly proportional to peace in Afghanistan. That is why Pakistan believed that Afghan own Afghan led government, ethnic, uh, uh, all inclusive government is the guarantee of peace in Afghanistan, then that guarantee the peace in Pakistan and the regional stability as well. So uh, we wish and pray that this peace should prevail, things should come to normalize, and some all inclusive government should be uh, established in the passage of time. A, a peaceful transition should take place other than, than, than the uh, disastrous effect fallout we can see. Now coming lastly to the question Mr. Ang, you have asked to me. Sir, as you know that Pakistan direct borders with Afghanistan. If something is positive in Afghanistan, we enjoy the dividend. If something negative is going on, then fall out on, on us. On us. Coming to China, China also has some part of the border with Afghanistan as well. Ladies and gentlemen, you know that Afghanistan is a land which is uh, endowed by the uh, precious minerals of three uh, trillion dollars worth. So Chinese are very uh, proactive in this regard to make uh, investment in their neighborhood, especially in the uh, mineral sector. And they have also shown uh, a good signal. And they are also hoping for peace in the region. And that is why uh, they are also forthcoming. They are also emphasizing that a normalcy should return. So if the world is interested in the peace in Afghanistan, they have to talk to someone better whosoever is at the helm of affairs, they must engage themselves, must negotiate themselves. If they don't talk to them, to whom they should talk? So let these Taliban gradually move forward, take their time for inclusive government and for inclusive government, that intrinsically, implicitly include the women as well, that also include other ethnic groups as well. This will bring uh, a, a, a gathering of, uh, through Loya Jirga, a big uh, tribe gathering with the tradition of Afghans. And I'm sure, uh, and I wish and pray that this normalcy should return to, to Afghanistan and uh, peace should prevail there. They and in and and the, the elements which are uh, uh, posing threat to the region, like ISS and Al Qaeda or anyone, anyone else, uh, they should not get roots in that society. Otherwise, they will be suffering for all the regional countries. And the foremost sufferer, other than Afghan, is Pakistan. So, with this, uh, lady and, and gentlemen, uh, I conclude uh, with this wish and prayer that early peace should return to Afghanistan. Let Afghan live a, a peaceful life because we are witnessing a turmoil in the country in the last four decades. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your patient hearing. Thank you very much. Uh, I will have another question for you as well after the round is finished. Uh, Professor Karaja, who is Alihan, uh, hi everybody. I really uh, want to moderate uh, this webinar with uh, distinguished uh, speakers, but uh, I am now in bed because of the COVID. So it is. I really want to uh, thank you. For, uh, thank you very much for you. Uh, it is a honor for me and also my university together with you. 
Sorry about that, but Alian is a very well moderator, as you see. Uh, thank you very much again. Dr. Thank Karaja, uh, uh, we pray for your speedy recovery and want to see you again uh, contributing uh, in the domain of knowledge and, uh, and wish you uh, a sound health very soon. Thank you very much, my brother Malik. Maybe uh, they don't know that we have uh, a real past with Malik. Uh, he's, uh, he was a, a retired uh, colonel from Pakistani army, uh, like me, from Turkish army. So we are uh, together with many times. Uh, thank you very much for everybody, yes. Thank you for your kind words. I really missing you and uh... Uh, it's a long time seeing you here in National Defense University, long time back here in Islamabad. I wish to see you again very soon. Hopefully you are recovering soon and we will interacting again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Kofi, actually I have a sort of a, a question that will sort of divert the subject a little bit to internal US politics, because this is something I sort of work on as an academician as well. What I see, obviously from the other side of the ocean, I see actually the support for Biden and Biden's administration sort of decreased as well as a result of this. I have seen some polls, we all look at some polls. I always thought the second campaign for Trump was a joke. It wasn't really going to happen, you know, after he lost the election. But now, I think it's a possibility if his health sort of allows it. What do you think are the reflections of all this mess uh, into the American internal politics? Yeah. It's a very important question. Um, I should say up front that uh, the Heritage Foundation as a nonprofit is also nonpartisan. Uh, so any uh, views I give uh, on this subject that's party political are very much my own personal views. Uh, we, we don't support Democrats or Republicans. Uh, we support ideas and ideologies at the Heritage Foundation. Um, yeah, with, uh, but anyone can see that President Biden's popularity is going down in the polls. Um, and I think there's a number of factors contributing to this. Uh, but um, without a doubt, the fiasco and disaster we saw play out in Afghanistan um, has contributed greatly to this. And, uh, you know, Americans... Um, it, 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 Americans don't like to be seen as losing. We don't like to be seen as being defeated. That's actually, just let me intervene there. People think now there's the talk that U.S. lost Afghanistan to China. There is this like sort of yeah. narrative. So yeah, that's that a, yeah. Biden maybe that would sort of. Uh, open my question a little bit more. Why my question? Yeah, no, that, 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 you're right. There is that perception there. And, and often and I encounter this when I speak to colleagues around town and I remind them that, you know, Afghanistan wasn't America's to give to China, right? Like, we, you know, we, we didn't really lose something we, we don't have. Uh, and also, I think that the, the rosiness of the early days of the Taliban-Chinese relationship will, you know, reality will soon set in. Um, and it will not be as easy for China or the Taliban as each side might think. Um, now, of course, China does play a take a pragmatic role when it comes to engaging with these sort of regimes. They really engage with anyone who is the de facto power, right? So it's not like they have some sort of, it's not like the Chinese Communist Party has some sort of ideological predisposition to um, Pashtu nationalism. Or anything like this, but uh, you know the the Chinese now see that the Taliban are the de facto power in Afghanistan, so they will deal with them. Um, <laughs> it's often forgotten that you know they, the two countries do share land border, however small or remote this land border might be. There is a land border between these these two two countries. Um, but in the U.S., I think had the evacuation gone more smoothly 
And if the government had not fallen as quickly as it did in Afghanistan, Biden wouldn't be in this situation today. I think that because very few Americans thought about Afghanistan one way or the other until the whole forever in the forever wars rhetoric was was brought back. I think Biden was hoping that after, uh, you know, a couple of days of some bad headlines because the Taliban might take a provincial capital uh, or take a, a, a province here or there, that Americans will go back to, you know, the back to their summer vacations. We're open, you know, for better or for worse, we're pretty much open here in America right now. People are going on holiday now, whereas last year they were all cooped up. So, you know, Americans were just started as well. So what's that? Football season started as well. So yeah, exactly, exactly. So there are a lot of distractions, right? So I think the Biden administration was thinking, okay, you know, a few days of bad headlines in August, we can write it out, and then uh, life will continue on. And maybe by like February, the Taliban might capture half the country or even capture the capital. But by then, you know, Americans are not going to be focused or care about this one way or the other. Instead, we had this rapid disaster unfold. I mean, think about this, like for 20 years, the Taliban was unable to capture and hold a single one of Afghanistan's 34 provincial capitals, right? Only on two occasions in 20 years did they capture a provincial capital and they only held it for a few days, right? Then all of a sudden, (laughs) you know, uh, over a course of 11 days, the Taliban captures Kabul. And th- this created this, d- this humanitarian disaster for the evacuations that um, was playing out every single day on Americans' television screens, on social media. And all they saw was pure incompetence and, uh, and disaster, right? And Americans don't, didn't like it. And uh, however much Biden wanted to blame Trump, you know, by this point, he had been in the Oval Office for more than 200 days, uh, and clearly the blame lies with him. Uh, this has definitely uh, hurt the, the, the president. But there are also other contributing factors as well in domestic U.S. politics. I mean, you saw some of the images from America's southern border. Um, this doesn't resonate well with your average American, whether they're Republican or Democrat. Um, so, yeah, if things aren't looking good in terms of um, President Trump's viability to come back in 2024. You know, who knows? I mean, uh, I, I think there are probably quite a few strong candidates on the uh, Republican side who might have a, a different opinion uh, on whether or not uh, President Trump should come back. Because let's not forget, I mean, he, you know, he did lose an election. Uh, and that doesn't really bode well for U.S. politics when it comes to making a, a comeback. So. But it has happened before. I'm sorry? It has happened before. That, uh, it has, yeah. I think Teddy Roosevelt came back. Yeah. Um, you know, so ha- but Donald Trump's no Teddy Roosevelt either. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but yeah, you're, you're right. Um, I, I think 2016 ushered in a new era of American politics where the old way of thinking, the old way of doing things no longer applies. So you can't really say, well, it never happened before, so it's not going to happen now. I agree with that. Um, But I I will say that there are some very strong candidates on the right in American politics who um, think they're younger, uh, they think it's their turn. And uh, and so we'll see what happens. Um, But uh, yeah, it's going to be a wild period of time between, I mean, think about this. Uh, This is all going to start in like 12 months, right? Yeah, <laughs> and, then we're, great, great. and then we're going to have 24 months of this chaotic political environment. I, I might actually just try to apply for a job in Istanbul for your university or, or you know, I, can, I don't know if I could take it. Uh, you another, can another half. I can create places for two years. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, you're right. Afghanistan has contributed greatly to uh to um, President Biden's uh, drop in popularity, for sure. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chetin, Mr. Minister, are you there? Can you hear me? We had a bit of connection loss. Can you turn on your mic, please?
Do you hear me now? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Sorry, we had a bit, bit of uh, uh, connection problem. Well, my second question to you is when we look at the relationship between Turkey and Pakistan, it, can it be an effective tool in with relations to Afghanistan? Well, uh, the, of course, uh, Pakistan is very important in Afghanistan. And uh, uh, they have very good relations and their leaders all has lived in in Pakistan uh, and especially in the Peshawar region. And they are all uh, educated in madrasas around uh, Peshawar. Uh, they are all educated there. And they have very good relation with, 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 with Pakistan. And I think uh, Turkey with, with Pakistan can play important role. Because when I was there, of course, uh, when I was in pa Afghanistan, what uh, we did, of course, to have tripartite meeting on the high, very high level. Musharraf, uh, our, our president, and, and Karzai, they had one or two meetings in, 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 in Turkey. And um, because without without a Pakistan, it's very difficult uh, to 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 have a, a state a stable government in, in in Afghanistan. But Pakistan should know that at the end of the day, they also face with threats because uh, the, the the peace and stability in the region is very important for Pakistan as well, because Pakistan has their own own Taliban. And their Taliban is even more than more, to, to my personal view, more dangerous than than, than, Pakistan, than Afghan Taliban. And uh, the, the 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 Pakistani government should know that they need stable and peaceful Afghanistan. Very important for for Pakistan as well. But unfortunately, uh, Pakistan and India had some kind of revenge, had, had kind of, the, I think, <laughs> the trouble with each other on, uh, in, in, in Afghanistan. I was telling them, don't, don't do anything about that because uh, India and Pakistan, they should have their own problem without including uh, Afghanistan. But, but we were not able to do that because, for example, uh, India, when I was talking with the uh, sheriff at that time, he asked me why India has consul general in Jalalabad. Well, if you look at the, at the end of the, it was, he, was, he was right, of course. Jalalabad has nothing to do with uh, India but it's very close to Pakistan. And uh, well, I couldn't find answer to that question because I, I, I told you, I don't know why, but they had, uh, uh, they had a uh, uh, council general in, 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 in Jalalabad. The only thing I was telling them that please, please don't do, don't, don't, don't play with each other in, in Afghanistan. Afghanistan has in, enough problem, but, now, again, Pakistan can play important role for inclusive government. I think that they tried, as far as I know, in the in the in the, in the, in the past, but they were not able to to reach that inclusive government. And another important thing, of course, China. China has, uh, I think, tried to. To, 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 to play, to, 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 to reach a policy through Pakistan in, in, with, 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 uh, with Afghanistan. China is very pragmatically because uh, when I was there, uh, they, what they did, of course, they, 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 they entered to minor, mineral, mineral in, 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 in Afghanistan. And they, they, they invested uh, kind of billions of dollars at that time. Still, they are doing that, I think. And um, Pakistan 
still is a key country to push Taliban for uh, inclusive government. Because without the inclusive government, uh, what will happen in Afghanistan, of course, uh, first of all, uh, they, they, they will not be recognition by important countries. They will not be able to get uh, financial support, which is very, very much important for, 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 for uh, Afghanistan. And I think the international diplomatic mission will leave Afghanistan. I think sooner is the better. The, 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 well, uh, I still do not know why they, did, they, 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 they didn't do that because they have some non-Pashtun minister, I think was mentioned, but they are Taliban. One, one, one I think, uh, uh, Turkmen or, 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 or Uzbek, but he's Taliban. We have one Tajik, I think he's also Taliban, because this is not inclusive government, because they are, they are, they are, they are Taliban. But mainly they are the same policy. Uh, well, I, 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 I've tried to be optimistic uh, about the future, but unfortunately, uh, so far, uh, I'm, I, 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 I'm disappointed, of course. I thought that after so many years, uh, 20 years, the, the Taliban will be able to have some moderate government, inclusive government, good relation with neighboring countries, and uh, not mentioning el, all ta, every, every time about Sharia law, because when they mention something about the school, they said, but we have to follow Sharia law. Because according to Taliban, we do not need in constitution. They said the Sharia law is the constitution. This is what they, they, they told us when I was there. And, uh, but this is 21st century. How you can follow the policy that 1,500 years ago in, in Saudi Arabia and so on. And unfortunately they are very, uh, they are, uh, Wahhabi ideology, very strict ideology, and I don't think they will be able to change this ideology. The only, the only, the only, 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 only chance for them, uh, as soon as possible, to have an inclusive government. I know that some pe person like Karzai, Abdullah, Abdullah, and even, even, even some other, they are trying to talk with the Taliban and try to do that because they didn't leave the country. Ashraf Ghani left the country, but uh, I, as far as I, I talk with Karzai and Abdullah as well, they are there and uh, they are trying to do that. But so far, uh, they, they, could, they were not able to do that. Again and again, the only chance for, 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 for Taliban to have an inclusive government. Uh, and uh, so far, there is no sign, I think, as far as I can, I can see, because they have very radical people in the cabinet. Uh, that that uh, they will, they will probably they will control the government, uh, because there are per person like Mullah Baradar. Uh, he is person for 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 dialogue, a person for peace. I think he tried to do it for that, but he was not so far, he was not able. I don't know how they will be able to work together with, 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 with Haqqani group, because Haqqani group, uh, they are only thinking about the military solution, which is no solution. But one thing that we have to, uh, I, was to I, I, I want to undermine the civilian government also could not be able to, 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 to govern the country because the corruption and, and, and other things were very, unfortunately, because uh, the people, uh, they, they never had full support of the people. They not even try last 20 years. Civilian government could play, could lost the chance that they could play in the, in the last 20 years. Because the, 
the, the, the, the, the, the perception of the people is that the money is coming to Afghanistan, but always go to corruption and, and not to people. They were not able to change this perception uh, in the past. And poor, poor Afghan people, I think, this is, uh, especially the women of Afghanistan and poor people of Afghanistan. And um, really, I'm very much sorry about them because they've been very nice people. And uh, they've been in the world last 50 years. There is no country in the world like that. Since 1979, I think, 79, 73, I think, when, when Dawood took over the government from, uh, from uh, uh, the king. Since then, 1973 until 2020, they were in the war. This is, this is unbelievable. And, and, and uh, this is why the people are, and the problem is that some people left the government, left Afghanistan during that period. They went to, they have well, well educated, and now they are coming, they want to take power in Afghanistan. But those who stay in Afghanistan, there's one, one, one million and a half people died in the last 50 years. And uh, no education, no economy, no job, and so on. And the international community, last 20 years, I think they should uh, support too, much more to, to civilian political, I said, social and economic development. As I mentioned, I think the US was spending 16, 15 billion dollars a year. and another 10, 12, 12 billion by NATO. And the majority of this money went to military area. Half of those people, money could go to civilian, I think the situation would be different because the Afghan people they was telling us that, well, the, 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 the more rich country in the world now in Afghanistan, but still they are, they are jobless, still they have no money, they still they have no job, no employment and no, no, no enough education, so on and so forth. And it was very difficult to tell them that, well, please be patient. At the beginning, they were very much optimistic at the beginning of 2001, 2002. But year and year, they become more pessimism about uh, the international community. We all made mistakes, I would say, let's say the NATO and US and all international community. And uh, I'm very sorry that we, we now again left Afghanistan alone. And uh, suddenly one day, America, US left, NATO left, and, 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 and with, with a lot of problems behind. And this is the failure I, I will repeat, repeat again that this is the failure of U.S. and failure of NATO. Because they were not too much uh, concentrate on build up, the con build up the country. Destroy country is very easy, but to, 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 to build up the country was not that much easy. And I think they did not too much attention to how to build up uh, the collapsed government or collapsed country uh, after so many years. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Tanya, my question is actually sort of a follow-up to what uh, Mr. Minister have discussed. You have been reporting on Afghanistan for over 20 years. So as you see the problem, you, you might be thinking about uh, sort of possible solutions or possible sort of, because as we discuss, I feel more grim uh, about the situation, but I think there might be some ideas of a solution. Maybe as a reporter, instead of an academic or a politician like the rest of us, maybe you will have a different sort of view on these things, I think, because maybe you might sort of bring a fresh perspective rather than us, like these grim guys talking about like everything is all gone to hell. I mean, do you have any 
sort of views that can solve the problems that we have been discussing. Like uh, yeah. Okay, yo, yo, no, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Well, if you're asking me as a journalist, I can certainly say that we, we do have a responsibility to report fairly and accurately what the situation is on the ground. Um, many uh, media organizations have come under attack for whitewashing uh, the Taliban over the last uh, uh, few years. Um, and I think that's something that has to be revisited because if, uh, if if we want the Taliban to respect the very basic uh, human rights requirements uh, of the international community, they have to be held accountable. Now, what's interesting is Zabiullah Mujahid gave a press conference uh, earlier today, and he said something to the effect, um, well, the international community has no right to dictate to us uh, how we should govern Afghanistan if they won't even recognize us. But the international community is saying, well, we can only really recognize you if you start, um, if, you, if you adopt policies that are um, that are compliant with the human rights um, standards of the international community. And so far, everything we've seen since they've taken control of the country is um, rolling back um, rights for women, um, minorities, uh, the inclusive government that they promised uh, to even Afghan opposition leaders never materialized, uh, even the government that they formed only really reflects one faction within the Taliban. So uh, this, this is where we stand. I mean, the best we can do is hold them accountable uh, for the situation on the ground. That's the only leverage the international community really has. Thank you very much. I mean, unfortunately, I agree with you. Most, mostly I agree with you, unfortunately. And Dr. Malik, I want to ask, I want to pose you the same question, actually. I asked Mr. Minister, uh, how about uh, sort of the role of the relationship between Turkey and Pakistan uh, affect the situation in Afghanistan? This is a question that uh, I, I want to ask you as well. Thank you, Alian. Thank you. For asking me this question. And this is very closer to my heart as our Heart is very closer to Turks. Of course, likewise. So, so uh, uh, as you know that, uh, both the leadership of the both countries has been very closely interacting with each other on the issue of Afghanistan and, and state of affairs, pre-departure of US forces from Afghanistan and the post-departure as well. Both have been consulting, both have been uh, having uh, a serious consultation, leadership has been meeting at various fora, they are communicating on telephone, even the foreign ministers are meeting with each other at various occasions. So the most pressing need for both the countries, they can join hands. They have already consultation so many things. As uh, recently, it is uh, Pakistan which facilitated the exit of even Turkish people there in Kabul and Afghanistan. I know personally they came to Islam, Bible provided not only Turks only, but other nations as well. We hosted them and we, we ensured their safe exit to their destination through Pakistan. So again, Pakistan and, and Turkey, both can join hand. They can engage the Taliban leadership as well. Please look and listen to the world community as well. They must pay attention to the aspirations of the international norms as well, so that at the earliest they should get recognized recognition from the world so they can move forward smoothly and sell the things at the, at the right appropriate level. As, as, as you know that uh, Pakistan and Turkey both are technically very sound and advanced countries, even in the aviation as well. I am glad that it was the Turkey which was facilitating the movement of the aeroplanes at the at the Kabul airport, and uh, and they very uh, skillfully managed those affairs, and they were having close interaction with the Pakistani aviation authorities as well for the for the uh, takeoff and the movement uh, air flights as well. But still I can think that both the countries 
at least can engage the taliban leadership and to convince them and also they must uh, uh, like pakistan has already given the humanitarian aid and uh, while joining turkey they always have uh, as softening towards the taliban rather the afghans as well to help them. i think afghanistan at the moment is in bad, it is 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 in a dire need of the support of international community and the pakistan and turkey can spearhead in this direction so that they converge all their resources all their energies how to help the afghan nation at this time when the sufferings are at their peak so both can use their leverage to the afghan and the taliban they can use their good offices they can facilitate the taliban and uh, uh, to hold uh, broad based uh, talks with all the ethnic groups um, uh, as in the past pakistan has been doing uh, this facilitating uh, the various afghan faction to sit and discuss and now i think turkey and pakistan can also join hand and to help out these uh, afghans and the taliban to come to uh, uh, to the table where other people could should also join them and they can move forward with some stable solution to govern the country but at the foremost requirement is to help afghanistan especially their humanitarian assistance and to convince the world that uh, uh, the afghan nation must not be penalized for someone they must be looked after at this uh, juncture of need thank you very much uh, does anybody before i wrap up does anybody have anything to add to the discussion uh, i would like to thank all of you for joining uh, dr malik uh, tanya and uh, mr minister along with uh, luke who had to leave just Uh, five minutes earlier, and also I would like to thank uh, Istanbul Aydın University for giving me this opportunity, as well as uh, Professor Kutay Karaca as well. I mean, I'm not glad I have this opportunity. I would rather listen to Professor Karaca speak, and then he he him being well. But this was a good experience for me as well. I hope he feels better, so he can direct. Uh, next one or the ones after that again this has been a broadcast live from istanbul from the western bank of istanbul from floria from istanbul Aydın university and thank you all for joining and we hope to see you more in the future Have thank, a nice you. Bye -bye. thank you bye bye everyone thank you bye thank bye you, everyone stay bye blessed bye bye, bye everyone Yes, Mr. Malik. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. I I I I fully endorse your view and uh, concur to whatever you said, uh, especially the second part of your your question. I totally agree with you, sir. Uh, uh, these Afghans they must be looked after by the international community yeah. because otherwise the humanitarian disaster would be there. And Pakistan and Turkey, I think they can play a leading role in that. and a uh, player interacting with everyone and thank you minister for your very candid opinion and your uh, uh, excellent thought for the relation of these two brother countries